Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Willful Defiance, the movement to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. My name is Veronica Terriquez, and I direct the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center, one of the co-sponsors of today's event. This event is also sponsored by UCLA Center X and the USC Equity Research Institute. To begin in the event, we're going to hear some spoken word from the Sacramento area you speaks. They don't care if our babies thrive at school, long as they get by at school. Get by institutionalized racism and intergenerational oppression systems that keep prison pipelines thriving. Disguised as willful defiance, I'm trying to understand why urban schools have the highest rates of incarceration instead of culturally relevant curriculum that should be liberation. Suspensions from school feel like eternity. Strategically guide the black and brown kids out when we truly come to school to get free. Stifle academic and social emotional education. I'm just saying, could this be racially motivated? Outcomes being primarily black and brown youth become academically stagnated, leading to suspensions, expulsions, less school participation, stereotypes perpetuated. Is your school pedagogy, discipline, or human elevation? Discipline data from the Department of Education found that black girls are five times more likely than white girls to be suspended at least once from school. This data infuriated when black girls are seven times more likely to receive multiple out of school suspensions. Where is the healing, motivation, and rebuilding? How do we stand in our confidence after it has been disciplined away? How do I come to school ready to learn when you are trying to strip my intelligence and make it seem like I am insane. Black girls are three times more likely to receive referrals to law enforcement when white girls are getting away with behaving the same way. And we already know what they are doing to black and brown boys, it's insane. Just check the data, it's been staying the same. I mean, steady increasing is definitely a shame. Do we want to teach black boys or do we want to lead them away? to trajectories that don't lead to school or higher education degrees. Schools act like they are paid to lead them to the police when it's supposed to be a safe haven to keep youth off the streets. Expand opportunities, increase chances to succeed. Shouldn't school be focused on how to keep young people engaged and excited to be in their seats? Stop mistaking our pride for reasons for us to collide with suspensions, infractions, eventually leading to the police. We try to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. It's definitely time for us to get free. Who their students are and the environment they are living in. What students have to go through when they go home and live through before they can make it back to school again. Have you taken the time out to comprehend the life experiences of the children you are teaching and how your experience greatly differs from them? We have to remember school can empower or be a major hindrance. Is your school pushing towards prison or the most beautiful existence? The difference is we fight for educational justice. Trust us, we won't stop until our babies get free. Educational liberation means we have to fight for what we believe. You can't suspend the truth out of our youth. You can't expel a generation that's meant to prevail. We demand an education where we can be more than our ancestors' wildest dreams. We want to go to school and truly be free. Can somebody explain to me why? As soon as we enter the room, the teacher says bye-bye. We not getting paid enough, why should I? Care for kids that don't care for self, that's just one last brother we have to worry about getting well. Can somebody explain to me why young sisters is being suspended disproportionately, hand bound and kicked out of school for throwing a tantrum tantrum, send out on Zoom for sending messages? Pipe down, little black girl, you're too domineering. Pushed out, harshly disciplined, over-criminalized, school not made for a black girl to shine. Can somebody explain to me why all my beautiful black and brown faces sitting in courtrooms over classrooms, juvenile offenders, minor underage, facing life rather than graduating? Something is wrong with this country's education. 
we losing our babies, perpetuating racism in a system that's not set up for us to win. If parents don't send their kids to school, we criminalize them. It's clear to me education is not for liberation, it's for disciplining. Can somebody explain to me why? Officer on campus arresting teens, placing minor in custody. It's a shame we live in a nation that doesn't invest in education. Can somebody explain to me why? Being black in school is a crime. My skin not willfully defiant. It's just a dirty trap to keep us trapped in a school to prison pipeline. Thank you, Dr. Tariquez, for the warm welcome, and thank you to Sacramento area. You speaks for the powerful spoken word. Can somebody explain to me why beautiful black and brown faces are sitting in courtrooms over classrooms? We won't stop until our babies are free. Greetings, everybody, and buenas tardes. My name is Eder Gawana Macedo, Senior Community Engagement Officer with the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center. We want to extend our gratitude to our sponsors, including the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center, the USC Equity Research Initiative, and UCLA Center X. We're so excited to host this event, capturing the power of young people in their quest to abolish the school to prison pipeline. Willful Defiance, the movement to dismantle the school to prison pipeline, shows how grassroots community organizing groups have worked to dismantle the school to prison pipeline and zero tolerance discipline, and advocate for police-free schools. This is a critical issue hurting young people across our nation that needs to be addressed. Our exciting panel today includes Dr. Mark Warren, professor at the University of Bo Massachusetts, Boston, Department of Public Policy and Public Affairs at the McCormick Graduate School. Dr. Warren has devoted his career studying efforts to strengthen institutions that anchor low-income communities. We also have Macy Chin, the executive director at Cadre, Cadre's mission is to solidify and advance parent leadership to ensure that all children are rightfully educated regardless of where they live. Jeffrey Winder, Executive Director at GSA Network. GSA Network is a next generation LGBTQ racial and gender justice organization that empowers and trains queer, trans, and allied youth leaders to advocate, organize, and mobilize an intersectional movement for safer schools and healthier communities. And we also have principles we also have, I'm sorry. And we also have Principal Mauro, Principal Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez and at Gonzalo and Mendez, Gonzalo Mendez High School in Boyle Heights, Los Angeles. He has been at the forefront of addressing school climate concerns through restorative justice and cutting edge approaches to student success. We have enabled the Zoom Q&A function where you can write your questions, which will be answered toward the end of the presentation. That being said, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Warren, Mark Warren. Okay, well, thank you so much, Edir, for the kind introduction. And uh, I wanna thank uh, Veronica Tariquez uh, for hosting and inviting us to come here tonight, um, as well as John Rogers from uh, Center X and uh, Manuel Pastor from USC. Uh, longtime friends of mine and community engaged scholars who I think are very committed to making our research really directly relevant by partnering with community organizing uh, groups that are really trying to transform our school systems and communities towards uh, education and justice. Um, Maisie Chin and Jeffrey Winder are, are partners with me uh, with the Willful Defiance book and ongoing efforts to you know, transform our schools and dismantle the school to prison pipeline. So, and uh, the, the video that you saw that launched uh, our event tonight by Sacramento U Speaks is another partner and they, they developed and wrote the, and produced that video specifically to help engage communities in different kinds of ways around uh, the themes of the book and the movement to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. So I'm gonna to try to talk for a few minutes to give you uh, a little bit of an overview of uh, what the, some of the themes of the book, what the book is about, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Maisie and Jeffrey who are, are featured in the book to talk also about the work that they're doing today as well 
and then a commentary from uh, Mauro, which I'm very much looking forward to. So I'm going to try to uh, share my screen, uh, which will hopefully work. Um, great. So um, I start the book uh, with the uh, story of Zakia Sakari Jabbar, uh, an African American uh, single mother at the time outside of uh, Dayton, Ohio. And she tried to go back to college. She put her son, uh, Amir, in preschool. And this is what she said. The problems began right away. The preschool gave me a hard time enrolling him in the first place. Then in the first week, I started to receive phone calls telling me he had a temper tantrum today. He's not wanting to transition from one activity to another. Is that not normal, I replied? Is that not something that your teachers can deal with? Then the preschool asked me to have Amir evaluated. Evaluated for what? It was as if he was a guinea pig. They made normal three-year-old behavior sound very pathologized and abnormal. And I realize now that I don't think we were ever really wanted there. Zakia refused to have her son evaluated and the preschool suspended him repeatedly and then eventually expelled Amir. He was suspended and expelled multiple times from other preschools and eventually Zakia had to drop out of college to take care of him. But before she did, she went to the college library and did a literature search on black boys in education. And she found that her son's experience was not unique. And she started talking with other black parents in Dayton, Ohio, and so many of them had the same experiences that they're uh, particularly that their black sons were being uh, suspended and even expelled as early as preschool. And she started meeting and leaving rooms with these parents across the city. And together they formed an organization called Racial Justice Now. Uh, and they joined a national coalition called the Dignity in Schools Campaign. And uh, through deep organizing amongst uh, black parents in Dayton and the support they got from the National Dignity in Schools Campaign, uh, they started to win some rapid victories. In a few years, they won a moratorium on pre-K suspensions in Dayton public schools. They changed the district's code of conduct to end zero tolerance discipline policies. They won the implementation of restorative justice in 10 schools, and they started issuing school discipline report cards for school districts across Ohio. But when I interviewed Zakia a few years later uh, from those events, she had this to say, <clears throat> Amir is in the fourth grade now, and this school year has been one of the most difficult. No matter what I do, I can't make the teacher see us differently. I can't make her love Amir. I can't make her see him as an energetic nine-year-old boy who has some leadership qualities that she could cultivate instead of viewing him as a menace or a nuisance. And I, I start the book with Zakia's story for a number of reasons. I think that it, uh, it shows the impact of the school to prison pipeline on children, but also on parents, which I think is often not particularly focused on or appreciated. It's the story of uh, Zakia, a parent uh, and a family who were at first victims, but were not just victims. They became racial justice organizers and were able to organize with other parents and, and in the book students to change policies. But it raises a question right at the heart of the book. How did a, a, a relatively small number of under-resourced community organizing groups change public discourse around zero tolerance and change policy and practice uh, in rolling victories across the country? And I try to answer that question in the book by uh, two main themes. One is the vital importance of deep organizing with people who are most impacted, that is uh, parents and students of color at the center of the movement. And secondly, the combining of that local organizing across the country to build the national movement, a national movement that then lifted up those local struggles and supported them. Um, but I also, uh, in the end, I think uh, wanted to start the book with that story because despite these victories, Zakia, I think names and identifies the, the enduring challenges of creating truly liber liberatory forms of education for our young people. Um, I was been myself been on a journey uh, to do this uh, project. Uh, I am a community engaged scholar or an activist scholar. Uh, and that means that I uh, seek out to form uh, deep partnerships, uh, don't study organizing groups uh, from, a par, from afar. And in fact, had a formal partnership with the Dignity in Schools campaign and with the Alliance for Educational Justice 
and then also partnered with other groups like Cadre in Los Angeles and about a dozen organizing groups across the country. And together uh, we uh, produced the research that uh, formed this book and are trying to engage audiences with it. We also produced a, a toolkit uh, on organizing because of our commitment to uh, not just write about the movement to offer, but to, to offer practical support uh, for the movement. And um, I will say that um, uh, I, several roads led me to this project. And I, the one I wanted to highlight was uh, when I, about uh, 15 years ago, I started the project uh, with Karen Mapp and a group of 15 doctoral students. And in fact, we, uh, we came and presented the, the findings of that book uh, at UCLA. Uh, John Rogers hosted us uh, with Center X and that book was called A Match on Dry Grass. And I, what I, it, it had six case studies of organizing groups. And at that time, we studied them as local phenomena. So we kind of drew a box around them. What they were doing in Denver, Padres Jovenes Unidos was really isolated at Denver. And at the time, I think that was uh, not a bad representation of what the world of community organizing around education reform or educational justice looked at at the time. But by the time the book came out, things had really changed. A lot of the local organizing groups were, were banding together across the country and forming national alliances. I think first and foremost, the Dignity in Schools campaign, uh, but also the Alliance for Educational Justice. Others may know the Journey for Justice campaign, the Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools. Uh, it was no longer accurate uh, to talk about community organizing as, an, as a local phenomenon entirely. And I was interested in studying how this emerging national movement was uh, being organized and what lessons that we could learn from it. And I felt because I uh, was listening to parents and young people in the research that I was doing that the school to prison pipeline and the movement to dismantle it was emerging as really the critical uh, educational justice movement in the country. I had some personal reasons, which I'm happy to share too for, for uh, uh, wanting to study this movement, but I think this is what like brought me to the project. Um, I'm not going to, uh, the book is not mainly about how the school to prison pipeline operates, but I do want to make one point. And that point is that mass incarceration starts at school. The rise of the school to prison pipeline is really part of the larger uh, system of what Michelle Alexander has called the new Jim Crow, can't be understood separate from that, even as you know, black children's parents are being criminalized and incarcerated at high rates, they then are often referred to police uh, or are even arrested in school or put on the road to the juvenile criminal justice system through harsh and, and racist school discipline policies. And we really need to understand the larger systemic structures that are, are criminalizing our young people and their family and leading to the intergenerational transmission of poverty and, um, and lack of power. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, but I think it's an important part of understanding why we need a movement uh, this is not a, just a set of misguided policies. It is really a systemic structure of, uh, of racism in our schools and our communities. Um, so the book starts off in Holmes County in the Mississippi Delta. And I think this is very important because uh, speaking as a scholar uh, and educator, the very first people to name the school to prison pipeline and start to challenge it were not educators, they were not scholars, they were not policymakers, they were not the, civil, the traditional civil rights advocacy community based in Washington. They were black and brown parents and young people in local areas uh, across the country. And I trace one of the key roots of the movement to Holmes County uh, in the heart of the Mississippi Delta, in the heart of the uh, slave system, where in the mid 1990s, even as policing and zero tolerance policies were ramping up in our schools, they were some of the first to name the school to prison pipeline and launch a campaign to try to challenge it. They called it the prevention of schoolhouse to jailhouse track. There were famous cases or cases that became infamous at that time. Case of uh, children, black children on a bus were throwing popcorn at each other. Popcorn hit the back of the white school bus driver. She drove the school bus straight to the police station and seven African-American boys were arrested and charged with criminal assault. And one of the very first organizing campaigns against the school, the prison pipeline, was their, was their case to uh, free those, uh, those young people who eventually the charges were dropped, 
but because they couldn't get transportation anymore, they ended up having to drop out or so-called so -called drop out but being pushed out of school. Um, the book then tries to trace the dynamic between uh, the local organizing that happened first uh, in places like the Mississippi Delta and then in South LA with the cadre organization that I'm sure Maisie will share more about and then how that local organizing then co coalesced into a national movement, uh, the Dignity in Schools campaign, and the back and forth about how, for example, Cadre's first victory uh, district-wide was the first district-wide victory in the country to challenge uh, uh, zero tolerance school discipline policies, the adoption of school-wide positive behavioral supports, how that was then lifted up and really was a critical force in forming the national movement and the Dignity in Schools campaign and then how that the formation of DSC then strengthened and supported uh, local campaigns. And I go kind of go back and forth to places like Denver with Padres Hovnes Unidos uh, winning uh, the first uh, district-wide effort to actually remove zero tolerance from uh, school discipline code of conduct, and then back to the national level and then to Chicago uh, and eventually uh, statewide in Illinois with the SB 100 campaign where a group of young people passed uh, the, at the time, most progressive statewide uh, policies on the school to prison pipeline. And so I'm trying to develop uh, uh, a sense of uh, how does a national movement emerge that has deep local roots and that really creates change locally, but is not limited to the local level. Uh, there's a, actually a discussion in here about how do you form a national movement like that that isn't focused primarily on Washington that isn't dominated primarily by professional advocates who have more money, more resources, and instead is accountable to uh, local base building groups. And actually, uh, Maisie Chin, who we're hearing from today, features in the story. She's here on this PowerPoint because a lot of the, uh, the work that was done in creating uh, of forms of organizing in places like Mississippi and then with Cadre were then lifted up and taken into a struggle at the National Dignity Schools campaign to create a set of policies and practices that kept that organization uh, accountable to people who are most impacted in organizing groups on the ground. Um, this is a large and diverse intergenerational and intersectional movement. And I try to chart the, uh, the developments along these lines, the assertion of uh, uh, black girls uh, issues and leadership in the movement and, and how does that happen in a way that doesn't detract from the criminalization of black boys. Uh, Jeffrey Winder, who we're going to hear from today, also features in, in, in the book and the work of the GSA network to really uh, help uh, and support LGBTQ, trans and queer youth organizing in the movement and asserting their issues and their leadership in the movement. And then uh, more recently, the emergence of the police free schools movement. And most people, you know, saw that emerge in the last couple of years, have no idea that actually this movement started at least 10 years ago when the Black Organizing Project uh, in Oakland in 2012 declared the goal of removing police from schools fully within 10 years, and then launched campaigns that then, then inspired other groups as well to take up this call. And so in really in the places where police really were defunded and removed from schools, including in Los Angeles, these were uh, for the defund, partial defunding. These were places where organizing groups had been organizing around this, laying the basis for this work for many years, doing political education, relationship building with public officials, had policy proposals uh, already submitted. And so I don't think we can really understand the victories that were won uh, in, tw in 2020 and more recently on the wave of uh, an, uh, anti-racist and anti-police violence protests without understanding the important work that community organizing groups had done and laid the basis for that. And that work is also charted in the book. So um, I'm not going to spend time to go through all this, but I try to take a look at what have been the impacts of this movement. Really, when this movement started uh, in 20 years ago, you know, zero tolerance was the law of the land. It was enshrined in state policies, uh, banning things like uh, or suspending students for something called willful defiance, which is why we titled the book that way. Actually, it was a criminal charge. And in many states, uh, students could not just be suspended for disrupting school, but they could be criminally charged for it, and some were. Um, in any case, it was the law of the land. 
uh, within 10 years that has been completely really overturned. Very few people will defend zero tolerance, even if it continues to be practiced in many places. Uh, look at the rolling series of victories. And in the places where I think organizing has been strongest uh, and policies have been changed, like in Los Angeles, there have been really drastic reductions in exclusionary discipline. I think in Los Angeles, it was uh, 75,000 lost days of instruction have gone down to, I think it's about 4,500 or 5,000 lost days of instruction now. Uh, but you know, at the same time, the enduring challenges, uh, the racial disparities have not changed very much. The persistence of police and policing practices, new forms of surveillance. And I think the challenge of really creating authentic alternatives that really transform uh, schools. So um, I just wanna end on that note. Um, I really believe that the movement to dismantle the school to prison pipeline is not really, you know, and the changes in discipline policies and even the removal of police from schools is not really the end goal of this whole movement. Uh, it's really an entry point into a discussion about, you know, what is the, what is the state of public education in many low-income communities of color? I think that many of us uh, have realized increasingly that this is a system based upon white supremacy and needs a wholesale transformation, not just in its school discipline or policing practices, but in, in, in its pedagogy, in its curriculum, and maybe more fundamentally in its relationship to parents and students uh, and families in the school. And I really hope that this book and this movement can contribute to a larger conversation and a larger movement around creating uh, education that is really uh, for the freedom and liberation of all our young people. So thank you very much. And I look forward to the comments of my uh, co-panelists. Thank you, Dr. Warren. Uh, up next, we have Macy Chin. Hi, Ryan. Good afternoon. Uh, there are a lot of friends and family on this webinar. And I am honored to have yet another opportunity and the privilege to share uh, you know, nuggets of, of wisdom from our work at Cadre in South LA. Um, I, my name is Maisie Chin, as you know, and I've had the honor of, and, and the, the honor of being trusted uh, to co-found and uh, lead Cadre as a parent organizing center in South LA for over 20 years. And I come into this conversation today really with a spirit of love for the possibilities of true intergenerational solidarity. And we often call for it, um, but I, I'd like to offer up for everyone's consideration that in order to have that, we truly need to invest in the healing and the recovery and the repairing um, of our parents and of our black and brown indigenous parents, um, of our extremely marginalized parents. Um, Cadre was formed on the heels of an era in California of complete assault on young people. Those of you who are from Cali know and remember Proposition 21 a huge escalation of incarcerating young people and certainly trying them and viewing them as adults. Uh, and so, you know, you hear Mark talk about parents and parent organizing and thank you, Mark, for, for always uplifting um, the unique contribution that parents can make to this. And that's really what I wanna focus on today um, because, you know, when Cadre started, you know, we didn't exactly know we were gonna end up specifically working on the school to prison pipeline, but we did know that we had to redefine what parent power looked like and certainly how it's held inside of parents themselves. Um, Rosalinda Hill, the co-founder of Cadre, she was actually that, that parent, you know, the one who was involved in everything. Uh, everybody knew her, all her kids went to that school. Uh, she was you know, on the payroll as a part-time, uh, community rep and greeted the parents every morning. And yet, however, her seven-year-old son, her youngest um, at that time, this was many, many years ago, still as a form of discipline with an IEP was locked in a closet. So you're telling us that a parent who everybody knows, no one can come down the hall and or figure out a different way of, of, of responding to her son's needs. And so from the get-go, we knew we had to redefine parent power, that all the stuff that, and I know there are a lot of educators and administrators on here. And so what I'm about to say, hopefully, you know, fundamentally everyone knows is true, is that all the existing frameworks for, for parents to make an impact on schools rarely allow parents to touch the holy grail of uh, 
of racism in practices that happen on school campuses. Um, and so that is what Cadre set out to do. We set out to, we didn't know, you know what we were redefining to, but we knew we had to really let go of the constrictions that parent empowerment or engagement really left for parents. And if parents wanted to tackle racism inside schools, that there had to be a different way. Um, and so you hear parents, yeah, 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 but I definitely want to acknowledge the power of parents choosing to risk everything. As Mark said, the parents are our, our, our siblings and family in Mississippi who risked everything to name the thing that was happening. As I always say, somebody had to believe those young people. There's children. Somebody had to risk everything to go up to the school office and call it into question. And everybody knows that school, quote unquote, school safety, order, et cetera, school discipline, all of that has always, before our movement, had always been the purview of school officials. It was never held up to public scrutiny. It was never allowed. And it was never considered the public domain, if you will, even though schools are public. So I really wanna name Ms. Rosin and Naomi and Adrian and Erlene and Kenny and Hakima, who are our founding core parents at Cadre, who chose back in 2004 that Cadre would actually be about ending the school to prison train, is what we called it back then. Um, and, you know, there's a lot more I can say about what we did. It's kind of all in the book, so I encourage you to buy the book. Um, but certainly, I just want to plant the seeds and really help folks, you know, shake up what you think about when, it, you know, when it when you hear parent organizing or parents ending the school to prison pipeline. Uh, we are on here today with so much of our family from Dignity Schools campaign, national and California specifically. Uh, my sibling Jeffrey, who you're going to hear from next, um, you know, we. Both have the honor of, of shepherding DSC California and DSC California um, in the spirit of what we did at the national level. We've also done that in, across the state of California. And we now, through so much heart and soul, we have a statewide network of parents across the state who are constantly uh, raising their consciousness, building their power, coming together with black and brown solidarity uh, to really create an ecosystem where we all can win at the local level. And I just you know, really hope that through, if you hear anything or get anything from what I'm sharing today, it's really thinking more imaginatively about the, what parent power could mean and what we need it to mean, that we need it to be a vehicle for liberation. And it isn't uh, a tool for the schools and the district's agendas. And so that, you know, we are, are doing incredible work at Cadre and I'm honored to be able to share it with you. Uh, and I'm certainly honored to be able to share this stage and this space with my sibling, Jeffrey. So turning it to you, Jeffrey. Hi, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Um, my name is Jeffrey Wind. I use he, him, his pronouns and I'm uh, calling in to you all from unceded Ohlone territory uh, here in Oakland, California. Um, I'm currently the co-executive director of GSA Network or Genders and Sexualities Alliance Network, uh, formerly known as Gay Straight Alliance Network. Um, but before that, and it does seem like a bit of a trip to think that it was over around 10 years ago, um, my role was, was leading our racial and economic justice programs at GSA Network. And that was really trying to examine um, the challenges for trans and queer youth of color to get a quality education. And at that time, um, we didn't quite know the, the sort of the terminology around school to prison pipeline or education justice, um, but we knew that trans and queer youth of color weren't making it to graduation and weren't receiving the same sorts of educational opportunities as other students. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, as I started doing the work, I was really talking to young people about what their experiences with school were, um, sort of how they ended up not uh, participating in, in a traditional education institution. Um, and we heard a lot of different stories, um, but you know, some that stood out sort of as themes would be you know, a student that uh, was female identified, but maybe ma more masculine presenting and wore a hat um, in class and was told to take their hat off and they would ask why all the other guys get to wear hats. You know, there's no rule against hats. And the teacher would say, 
something along the lines of, well, you're supposed to be a young lady. Um, or students who would, uh, you know, wear a rainbow bracelet and be told that it's not part of the dress code, um, but there's no sort of dress code against bracelets. Um, and so really just many instances in which sort of the um, sort of uh, biased and subjective nature of school discipline was made super apparent. And I think, you know, the challenge with, um, the challenge, but the kind of extenuating and, and multiplying circumstances that trans and queer youth of color face is that they're both facing sort of racist, um, racist and uh, gendered narratives in which uh, tell them how they're supposed to be and who they're supposed to be. Um, and so I think as we here in California, particularly we're looking at sort of ways in which trans and queer youth of color were getting um, pushed out of school, uh, willful defiance and the idea that a teacher could just say one day, like your identity is defiant um, or your existence is defiant uh, was one of the major critical issues that was facing trans and queer youth of color in being able to stay in, in school. And this was going back to like elementary school with uh, students being, um, you know, any, any you know, form of gender nonconforming in, in what that looks like in, in elementary school and what they want to uh, play with or their pursuits or their interests. Um, and, you know, I think that part of what we can understand from the trans and queer youth of color experience within in education and the school to prison pipeline. Um, and if it wasn't super sort of clear before, but that a lot of these things are not about necessarily behavior, but are about um, identity and creating the, um, and, and, and that if we think more sort of broadly about how punitive um, uh, discipline works, that it's really about a policing mindset um, that ends up creating situations in which authority, the school, um, polices not only behavior, but identity based on what sort of master dominant narratives and white supremacy and heteropatriarchy say um, are the, the ways in which students should show up or be accepted or be behaved uh, or behave. And so, you know, as we think about um, this current moment and sort of the backlash that we're in uh, across the country with trans and queer students, but, you know, also linked to this idea around critical race theory, um, that the idea of, uh, the, the idea of, of young people um, being able to name who they are and have the freedom to pursue the future that they, they want is what is also being policed as we think about the concept of police free schools. And I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, last but not least, we definitely want to welcome Principal Mauro Bautista at the Visitas in Gonzalo Mendez High School. Welcome. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation, first and foremost. I uh, hope everyone is uh, safe and healthy, and I hope your families are safe and healthy. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So I get an opportunity today to talk about Mendez High School's resistance, resistance to uh, a former LAUSD policy, which was uh, the random wanding of students, the daily random wanding of students. <clears throat> and before we get into the policy, a little bit of historical context. Um, um, Mendez High School was an LAUSD public high school uh, that opened in the Bow Heights neighborhood in 2009. We were the first uh, LAUSD high school built in Bow Heights in uh, nearly 80 years. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to open the school as assistant principal in 2009 and then became principal in 2011. I was also very fortunate that when I became principal in 2011, I'm um, in this high school um, through the <clears throat> Partnership for LA Schools, which is a network of schools within LAUSD that Mendes is a part of, receive restorative justice training before the entire district was receiving restorative justice training. It was uh, very early on. Um, and uh, I think it really impacted the way that we looked at um, school culture and relationships at school. 
uh, it certainly had an impact uh, on me as, uh, as a principal. Uh, one of the biggest takeaways from the restorative justice training is the importance of relationships at school. So relationships between students and students, uh, students and adults and adults and adults, and the importance of fostering very positive relationships among uh, everyone who shares spaces at school. Uh, also, very early in the 2010s, LAUSD began to pilot uh, what they call a school experience survey, where they uh, send out a pretty extensive survey to staff, families, and students, uh, asking a whole array of questions, academic and social emotional. On the social emotional side, students were asked, you know, do you feel safe at school? Do you feel connected to school? Is there an adult at school that you can go to? And um, we feel that thanks to the restorative justice training that we got, and also some of the restorative justice practices that we implemented, our students would answer in the affirmative to those questions a lot higher than the district average. So for example, as an example, to a question of, uh, do you feel safe at school? <clears throat> and this high school students would answer something like 91% versus a district average of 68%, just as an example. We were very proud of that data. And then uh, came a random wanding or the implementation of a policy that existed since the early 1990s. So random wanding, um, was an LAUSD policy that was actually implemented in the 1990s following some school shootings in that decade. Uh, it was it really, although it was a policy that lay dormant for many, for many years, you know, when I became principal, I didn't even know about the policy, but in the mid 2010s, following more school shootings nationwide, uh, the district decided to enforce it. Um, at first, we, since they had never enforced it before, we thought, well, we're not doing it and we have, we feel are very good about our school culture data. Our students are indicating that they feel safe and they feel connected to school. And so we said, okay, we'll just do what, we, what, we, what we're gonna do. But pretty soon it became evident that the district did want it enforced. And um, they wanted us to turn these, these in. These are uh, <clears throat> logs that every school was supposed to submit every day. Uh, we were supposed to do, I think, I can't quite remember, but I think we were supposed to do um, like a certain amount a day and a certain amount by the week. Um, at the time that it became evident that the district did want us to do that, we had a lot of questions and, and, and pushback on this policy. Number one, we wondered why LAUSD was the only major district in the nation enforcing this type of policy as we did our research. Uh, we also wondered if uh, why a district that serves predominantly brown and black students was trying to enforce this policy. We wondered if this policy would be enforced in a district that was predominantly not brown and black. <clears throat> and, um, you know, although, although, not although Random One did not implement it at Mendes, our student leaders who had contact with other student leaders at other schools overwhelmingly voiced that if we ever did implement this uh, policy that it would disrupt class instruction and made them feel criminalized, which is what many students who were in schools where this policy was implemented, they verbalized uh, that, that's, that's, that that was their experience, that they would select them in the middle of, of classroom instruction. So they, their mindset would be off when they would come back in. And then also that they, that they felt criminalized. Now, when, um, when this policy was being enforced in LAUSD, Mendes took a very clear um, uh, stance that we were not gonna implement this. <clears throat> and initially our stance was, we're not gonna do this at Mendes High School, but that, that quickly shifted to, you know, we cannot be on an island on this, otherwise uh, it's not gonna work. How can we work with other schools or other groups who feel the same way and hopefully possibly change policy. I do wanna share that back when this first started, we were definitely an outlier. Um, we, there, there weren't many other schools at that time willing to stand with us, but <clears throat> we were able to um, take some steps, find some co-conspirators and find some opportunities to gain some momentum 
and uh, and then this policy eventually was overturned. Number one, we'd uh, instead of just accepting the policy, we'd verbalize it in many uh, meetings that were held. We uh, shared our viewpoint about um, how we thought, thought that this was a, a racist policy and how it was setting everyone up as was uh, as is the theme of today's seminar setting them up to uh, be part of the prison, the school to prison pipeline. I mean, if, you, if you're gonna search everyone, you end up finding something, what's the next step? Take them to uh, LA school police and get them cited, um, maybe even arrested. Um, so um, some, of the ally, some of the allies that, that we found um, was uh, the Mendes High School adult community was very helpful. So, you know, some of the counters that that were shared to us is, well, your parents will probably want this. I said, well, how do you know? We haven't asked our, our families and parents and overwhelmingly our parents supported the non-random uh, uh, non, non wanding policy. Uh, the Partnership for LA Schools served as a huge buffer for us in the back and forth with the district. And as we are uh, resisting this policy, we find out of course that uh, other organizations in LA, in LA such as Students Not Suspects, Students That Serve, ACLU, Black Lives Matter, Brothers Son, Sons Selves, and eventually uh, UTLA, were also uh, re beginning to resist this policy. And so all of us eventually were able to come together in order to resist. And finally, one huge opportunity that we had was we were able to host LA City District Attorney Mike Fuhrer in a, uh, in a ribbon panel on school safety. And he also agreed that the steps to take were to soften schools, not harden them. And eventually the policy was, uh, was overturned and uh, I was, we were able to write uh, an op-ed on it and also be, we were able to go on a couple of uh, educational programs to uh, talk against the random wanding policy. Well, thank you so much, Principal Bautista. Um, we have about 10 minutes left um, for question and answers. And so we have two questions. Um, I believe this question is for you, Principal Bautista. As for student surveys, did any students indicate they felt safer with security guards or district police and or, met and or metal detectors due to the fear of guns, et cetera? Yes, I mean, uh, it wasn't 100% uh, one way or another, but it was overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly um, the students overwhelmingly did not want the policy to be enforced and the parents overwhelmingly did not want the policy to be enforced. And so we were able, of course, to learn and then talk about the different philosophies around school safety, the softening of schools, which is um, building relationships, having um, social emotional uh, support at school versus the hardening of schools, which is random wanding metal detector school police on campus. And uh, all research indicates that the softening of schools is what makes the school safer. Thank you. Um, we have another question here that um, there seems to be some interaction here from Gloria Soto. Um, I've seen community organizing groups remove resource officers off campus. However, there's been white backlash by affluent white community members claiming scores are less safe. How would you go about addressing these vocal minorities that tend to use aggressive organizing tactics? Um, Dr. Warren, do you wanna start answering this question? Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm having trouble starting my video, I guess. All right, here we go. <laughs> um, well, sure. And I, uh, I'll say a couple things about it. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, this has been happening, you know, students are returning to school this year, really traumatized by uh, the pandemic, by isolation, by loss in their families. And they're coming back to schools that really, for the most part, have not invested in, you know, really support services in, in, for them. Uh, and they're coming back to, you know, and it's not surprising that there may be some incidences of fights or other kinds of things. There's actually no evidence that there's been more of them this year than any other time, actually. But I think so. I think what we're seeing is an effort to you know, capitalize in, uh, on some of these incidents as part of a, a you know, a, what we call a white lash uh, movement to, uh, to roll back, 
you know, at least the beginning gains in police free schools. I mean, over 130 districts actually did pass policies to remove uh, or heavily defund police from schools uh, in, in the year after the mass protests. So, um, and I think it's also connected to the efforts to uh, ban the teaching of critical race theory in schools, which of course isn't even actually taught in schools for the most part, but teaching of any uh, critique of racism and racist history in our schools. Um, you know, so I think that uh, we have to, uh, you know, think about how to both redouble the organizing uh, and, uh, you know, just telling a different story, um, as I think Mauro was also talking about, of what actually makes schools safe. There is no evidence that police make schools safer. Um, what they do is criminalize our students, take the emphasis away from teaching and learning, increase contact with the criminal justice system. And so I think we have to come back with a stronger narrative and a stronger push for authentic forms of uh, whether it's restorative justice or transformative justice that really you know, support students uh, in this moment, but really support and transform uh, the whole school community. I'll let others also weigh in on this. Um, I appreciate the question. I think also the 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 white lash can also it could also be you know a resistance uh, from our own folks, and so you know I I would say you know being the organizer that I am that you have to anticipate this opposition when you're organizing against this, and you have to organize both your contingent as well as how to out organize the opposition. Um, so I'm going to put in a plug for really, you know, strategic organizing and alliance building and movement building. I would say the other thing is that we have to get, you know, let's get sophisticated. This is going to the belly of the beast of the whole settler colonial, colonialism project in, in, on this land. And, um, and we have to, you know, we have to know that that's what we're up against. We're, we're pulling out the one thing and the whole thing that makes the whole thing go down. And so um, we have to train our folks to understand history. We gotta train our folks to understand um, all the different ways that people have attempted to address um, uh, racial inequities and failed and why is because they never really went to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is who is, is really the value of, of human beings, you know, their souls and their bodies, but certainly their bodies when they're in school as Mauro's example fully tells you. And I think that what's important is really to believe that we actually have, we can and we need to be, and we can prepare to be um, ahead of the curve. A lot of times we don't think that we're, you know, and, and we need to, we need to out strategize and out organize, and we need to be fully prepared for the absolute resistance to any of this because it's literally undermining the entire thing uh, and it's doing it at a mass level because it's doing it at the level of schools. So it, it affects way more folks than even the, the, the cages, you know, that we use to lock people up. Um, this is a lot of people and it, it shapes things for multiple generations to come. So just putting in a plug for big thinking here and, and banding together to really do that big thinking. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions and I think we have uh, time for one more um, from John Rogers. Dr. Warren started with the powerful story of a mother who concluded that her son's teachers did not love her son. To what extent and in what ways can organizing play a role in shifting the ways that some educators value the young people they are serving? Uh, Dr. Ward? Oh, well, maybe Je Jeffrey hasn't had a chance to, to jump in. Maybe we'll give him a chance. I, if there's time, I could say something after. You know, I think that, <clears throat> you know, and I was reflecting on this with some of the students, um, the idea for, at least for the LGBT movement, that we have all these letters connected and we're connected by this concept that there's some way to be human beings that's not clearly articulated in our society yet, um, but it's based on this mutual idea that you can love in multiple ways and, and how you want, right? Um, that within the concepts of like, how are we rebuilding a, 
uh, an education institution that values the lives of young people, whatever they may be, that we're reimagining what that role of teacher is, right? And that there is a way in which love can play a role and should play a role in. And I think that if you ask most teachers that that's part of what got them into the profession um, is a love for young people and the idea that they can help shape these lives. And it's about an idea that, that loving the young people isn't about you know, what they look like, but it's about that human being in front of you. Um, it's not about their gender expression or their sexuality or their race. Um, and I think that that is taking hold in, in many ways in which, way, um, in which uh, folks are thinking about you know, the restorative justice, um, thinking about social emotional supports for students, um, as well as uh, you know, critical thinking about themselves and their own biases by teachers and administrators and, and educators in the field. Um, so I do think that organizing can move us there. I do also think that it's about a larger reimagining of what the role of educator um, is and means. Um. Yeah, I, I could just add, I, you know, I really, you know, I would agree with what Jeffrey has said, but, you know, I think, you know, education really is a, a human endeavor. It is relational. Um, unfortunately, it has been turned into sometimes something else in this country, a system of control and domination. Uh, and, you know, then teachers themselves, you know, can be cogs in that machine. <laughs> unfortunately, and are under a lot of pressure. And, uh, you know, but I think that at the same time, uh, it's important for teachers to also take, a, you know, a hard look at, at themselves, not every teacher, but so many teachers. And, you know, what is their role in this system? Why did they get involved in education in the first place? How are they actually treating uh, not just their students, but the families of their students and these really deep, you know, deficit notions, you know, I, I mean, I spent many years at a school of education and with educators and some of the, you know, attitudes are just so deep. And I, and that's why I do think that, you know, I really center in this book, the role of, of parents and young people of color and really building a movement that's forcing change. And, and there's, a, there's some dynamic here where there's got to be power and there's got to be forced and there's got to be a struggle and at the same that that really gets things started but at the same time you know teachers have to transform themselves we are talking about new kinds of human relationships a different kind of society um you know and so if we can transform our schools towards educational justice and human liberation and human relationships then i think that's the model and the entry point to trying to transform our entire society Thank you, and thank you everybody for, for taking uh, the time. Uh, we're running out of, of, of time here, so um, I'd like to give uh, 30 seconds to our panelists to give us any final thoughts um, regarding our topic today, and then we'll close it out. Um, Principal Bautista, do you wanna get us started? Well, I just think this is a, an incredibly important topic. And I just wanna thank um, everyone who, who joined today I think we had over 130 uh, participants and uh, thank you to UCLA and, and USC for the invitation to present. Dr. Ward. Sure, I'll, I'll just add that um, <clears throat> I think, you know, we're speaking here at, um, at UCLA and I think that, you know, part of the problem is that we have this hierarchical system and that you know, edu educate policy policy researchers and scholars and you know educational administrators think that they have all the answers that can really you know meet the needs of students. And that that system is fundamentally broken. It has not uh, changed our schools towards equity and justice. And we need a new paradigm. And I think uh, the movement for the dismantled school to prison pipeline offers. Uh, a route in that direction. And I think that <clears throat> just the way that we have tried to organize this panel tonight, um, I am the author of this book, but I, I refuse to speak about it on my own. I always insist 
that uh, people who are doing the organizing and if even possible, parents and young people themselves uh, come and have their own voice and that it's by bringing together scholars and organizers and parents and young people and educators like Mauro that we really have a chance to, to transform our, 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 our schools and our communities towards um, educational justice and liberation. So thank you for hosting us to try to model in a small way the approach that we really think we need to be taking. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, thank you all so much um, and uh, everyone for hosting. Um, I think just in this moment of reimagining our world and our way of doing school, whether that's remote or in person or however we end up doing it, that we're also listening to and believing young people and parents about what their ideas for a radical liberatory education um, could look like. And that we, as a, as a movement, um, work towards making this next uh, century of education be far different than the last. Macy? Hey, I, yes, I echo everyone's gratitude for, for being invited to do this and, and for everyone today who took time out to listen and digest this. Again, I'm just going to reiterate how I came into this conversation today, which is really a spirit of love for the radical possibilities of real intergenerational solidarity. So I'm going to leave you with this one thought, which is how can we love the kids but hate the parents? So. It's powerful. Thank you so <laughs> much, everybody. And thank you all for attending today's event. And thank you to our panelists. The link to Willful Defiance, the movement to dismantle the school to prison pipelines in the chat box. Um, we again want to thank our sponsors, including UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center, the USC Equity Research Initiative, and UCLA Center for Center X. Thank you all and have a good evening.